Today we're going to continue on with our conversation about uh, yielding. So just kind of a quick reminder. So we're looking at, in mechanics, the kind of fundamental curve that we're looking at is the stress-strain curve. We've talked a lot about uh, region one, which is your elastic regime. We are going to, we've talked just a bit about the plastic regime. So remember, plastic uh, deformation is permanent deformation. It's where dislocations start to move. Um, so that's distinguishing it from the elastic regime, which is uh, basically a reversal of deformation, pulling on the bonds, not moving dislocation motion. So we talked about yield criterion last time. We'll get into fracture in a little bit, but today we're going to be talking about a, a really kind of cool topic, which is yielding mechanisms. And specifically, how do we as uh, material scientists um, basically change or process our materials in order to increase or decrease your yield stress? So yield stress is an important parameter because, again, it's this, you know, the stress you have to require to yield the material. So there are going to be some applications where you're going to want to increase your yield stress to make sure there's no plastic deformation. Other times, you're going to want it to be a little bit more ductile. So you can't infinitely kind of increase yield stress. You usually pay a penalty. So if I have a material like here that has a really, really high yield stress, it will typically fracture before another material which has a same Young's modulus but lower yield stress. It will typically have a higher ductility. So that's kind of the annoying uh, and kind of frustrating part about material scientists is you can't, um, especially mechanics, you can't infinitely kind of increase your, you know, the strength of material without paying a penalty in ductility. But uh, we'll get more into that a little bit later. So first, if I've had a perfect material, uh, and I know you guys love my derivations, but I, so I won't uh, kind of bore you with it. But if I have a perfect material, so if I have this kind of perfect row of atoms with no dislocations, and I shear this material. So I apply a shear stress, and I just shift these atoms where it hops over one atom. So if it hops here, like after my shear, it hops. This would be essentially creating a dislocation, right? Or, or moving dislocations or you know, initiating dislocation motion. If we had a perfect material, I could calculate uh, basically the theoretical stress required to kind of make this deformation happen. So going from here to here. So that yield stress would be approximately 200 gigapascals. Now, this is much, much higher than the actual yield stress of a material. Uh, for example, let's kind of say we're dealing with copper, which your yield stress of copper is approximately 40 megapascals. Uh, remember that because in your, you could use this as your literature comparison because in our mechanics lab, you're actually going to be measuring the yield stress of copper. So there's one answer to your lab report right there. Anyways, what's the big difference between these kind of two values, between our theoretical, so that 20 gigapascals, so our sigma y theory, versus our sigma y experimental. What's the difference? Why is this three orders of magnitude, 20 gigapascals, 40 megapascals? Why do we have this huge difference? Because as we've talked about in lecture three, there is no perfect crystal. We always have dislocations. Dislocations will basically allow us to uh, basically initiate dislocation motion you know, easier than if we had a perfect crystal, right? Because the atoms are already displaced, so it's easier to kind of move and essentially shift those atoms and uh, create that motion. So you could always kind of, um, uh, this is a really nice approximation to have, especially if you're going for job interviews. So the theoretical yield stress will typically be G over 30, and the theoretical fracture strength, same idea. You know, the theoretical fracture strength is less than the actual fracture strength of your material because, again, there's always dislocations. So these are kind of two parameters that will really impress, again, if you could kind of remember this for any future material science uh, or really any, any engineering job interviews. So the, real, the answer is defects. Um, and specifically dislocation motion, and they're gonna kind of move you know, throughout your materials. So let's go ahead and uh, we talked about that criteria last time. So when materials uh, yield, we're gonna initiate dislocation motion. So we talked about this, and I actually, we, you know, we spoke uh, quite a length about this when we were talking about the um, lecture three, which is defect motion. So atoms and actually lecture four, uh, lecture four as well, diffusion. So where is slip is going to occur along the kind of close packed directions and close packed planes, the easiest direction to hop and move. So for FCC, when we talk about uh, slip systems, what were our close packed directions and our close packed planes? Well, we remember the close packed, like, we only had a close packed plane for FCC structures. So we said that our family of close packed planes was 111, so close packed planes. Directions, if you remember the family directions, that was going to be 110. So the primary slip systems are going to be those two. For BCC, do we have any close packed planes? No, of course not, because there are no close packed. Um, it is BCC is not a close packed structure. But instead, 
we do have closest pack planes, which is one uh, one one zero. You can kind of go back and watch some of the YouTube videos where I kind of t uh, discuss that uh, from our lecture three material. And we have our close pack dire closest pack directions. So C here is closest closest pack directions, and our closest pack um, our closest pack directions is one one one. So those are where dislocations are going to move and they're going to slip. And one other really kind of cool parameter, uh, and again, a nice one to have uh, for job interviews, we kind of um, discuss like how, how many dislocations there are in a material via the dislocation density. So this parameter row here. So N is the number of dislocations uh, in a given area. So it's going to be basically like the number of dislocations per millimeter squared. If we have a highly cold work material, meaning like if I am working with titanium and I have my rollers and I send my titanium sheet through these rollers and I kind of squish it and I highly work it and I kind of roll it and crush it. Um, you could kind of think of it like taking a, a wire hanger and if you kind of rotate it around and kind of twist it, it gets harder and harder and harder to work because the number of dislocations as you kind of plastically deform your material, it increases. So for a highly cold work material, our dislocation density is like 10 to the 14th uh, dislocations per uh, meter squared. For a highly annealed material, so annealing is when you put a material in a furnace. So I put my, you know, so let's say this is my, this is my piece of metal. I put it in this kind of furnace here and I basically let it sit there at high temperatures below the melting temperature, of course, for long times. What happens to uh, the dislocations if I leave something at high temperature for long times, just like we talked about for Kirkendall effect and diffusion? Your dislocations are going to kind of move and uh, basically go to the surface of your material. So the dislocation density after annealing, so putting a material at high temperatures for long times, your dislocation density is going to decrease. So that'll be about 10 to the 7th per meter squared. So look at that. Just based on a processing step, we could change the number of dislocations in our material by seven orders of magnitude by whether we put it in a, in a furnace and let it uh, basically at high temperatures and long times or if we cold work the material. So that is a huge, again, in material science, we're not concerned with 10% or 20% improvement. This is seven orders of magnitudes change, and that's going to drastically affect the yield stress of your material. Because we're going to see here how does the yield stress uh, basically scale with the number of dislocations. So let's get to kind of the fun part here. So we're going to talk about uh, basically four different types of dislocation or strengthening mechanisms in this class. Um, so this is just a little, you know, you can also kind of see how far, you know, how far spaced uh, the dislocations are apart based on the dislocation density. It's kind of built in already to your uh, definition. But anyways, so we can change, so we could control or we could change the yield stress of our material based on four kind of mechanisms or processing steps that we could um, basically do to our materials. Those four in order are going to be work hardening, solute strengthening, grain size strengthening, and precipitate strengthening. So... I'm going to kind of box these right here. We're going to talk about all of them in a second. So we're going to see lots of equations pop up. But again, keep the physical insight. And the basic idea here is that your yield stress is going to increase when it becomes harder for dislocations to move or propagate. That's the fundamental idea for all of these different types of mechanisms. Are you making it harder or uh, harder to move dislocations or are you making it easier to move dislocations? Harder to move dislocations, you're going to increase yield stress. Uh, if you make it easier for dislocations to move, you're going to decrease yield stress. That's basically kind of the concept here in a nutshell. So we are going to go ahead and talk about these four in detail next time. Uh, and yeah, hopefully, again, this is a little short video. Uh, we'll get into kind of the scaling behavior next time. But again, just to give you a little bit of insight into yielding. And yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye.